term punctuated evolution is part of the uh, new uh, extended synthesis language. How, how does it differ from the Eldridge Gould concept of punctuated uh, equilibrium, which argues that uh, evolution has not been a gradual process uh, as reflected in the fossil record? Yeah, so this is um, it's a somewhat controversial area because it, it involves, um, um, first of all, um, estimations of time scales. When um, Gould and Eldridge first presented their idea of punctuated equilibrium, they were just pointing to the fossil record and saying that um, things that were considered gaps in the fossil record because there were discontinuities in the forms that were uncovered might not truly be gaps. Things may have happened relatively fast and therefore one form supplanted another form um, by um, uh, uh, evolutionary processes that were not entirely gradual. Okay. Now, um, then there was a kind of, um, over the years, I would say, kind of a backing off from considering what, what um, uh, evolutionary biologists would call saltational mechanisms, which are true, true jumps, um, so that you have one form uh, being uh, replaced by another form very rapidly. Gould and Eldridge would both talk about um, uh, rapid in a geological sense. So they were talking about um, millions of years of evolution rather than hundreds of millions of years of evolution. Um, I actually, from our own work and the work of um, other scientists uh, looking at physical determination of, uh, of biological form, um, there's a very good case to be made, and there's a lot of experimental data behind it, that true jumps are possible. So I'll give you an example of, um, uh, we now know that the mechanism um, by which um, the um, number of segments of organisms like ourselves are generated, like our backbones uh, have uh, serially uh, repeated vertebrae. So there, there's a certain number of them, 30, 40. Um, and some snakes have 300. Okay. And, and uh, we know that the process that generates these blocks of tissue uh, is a process that involves an oscillation, a clock-like mechanism. And this kind of beats time, and the time is translated into spatial discontinuity. So whenever you reach a certain point on the clock, you cut off another block of tissue and you do it again. And that clock can run faster or the clock can run slower. And what makes the clock run fast or slow, um, even if it is a small change, it can lead to uh, a transition from 40 blocks of tissue to 300 blocks of tissue all in one step. So you can get saltational jumps. Um, it doesn't have to be gradual. You don't have to go from 40 to 41 to 42 to 43 up to 300. You can get jumps like that. And we, we know that that's the case. So um, even though Gould and Eldridge um, backed off of saltational mechanisms, we now know from embryology that saltational mechanisms are very plausible mechanisms of evolutionary change. You say that all 35 or so animal phyla self-organized by the time of the Cambrian explosion half a billion years ago using a pattern language, dynamical patterning modules, DPMs, um, and that selection followed as a stabilizer. Is that correct? Yes, that's what we... Um, as these terms apply uh, to your hypothesis, what do you mean by self-organization and selection? Do you mean a selection in the Darwinian uh, survival of the sense? Um, yes, to some extent, and um, there are other ways that selection acts as well. So, um, it, um, first of all, the self-organization, self um, we mean that um, uh, when cells get together and form clusters, um, there are physical processes that are um, relevant to material on that scale. So um, a single cell is a very small object and um, it, um, it's subject to certain physical uh, forces and, and 
uh, cells can be knocked around uh, randomly if they're in a fluid medium or something. When you get to larger structures, um, you have um, things operating like um, diffusion, uh, the flowing of uh, materials from one end to the other that can cause uh, non-uniform uh, gradients. And uh, you have um, cells and clusters, uh, some of them being more strongly adhesive and some less strongly adhesive. So you'll get a separation like uh, two immiscible liquids like oil and water so that you get different layers of tissue due to this process. Um, then you, you can have um, interactions between cells where a cell will um, uh, exert some uh, uh, inhibitory effect on the cell next to it. So cells right next to one cell won't do the same thing that that cell is doing. So these are all processes that um, use molecules and genetic uh, means that were evolved for single cells. But in the new multicellular context, um, the along with the physical processes that are characteristic of this um, kind of uh, more um, uh, larger scale uh, matter, you get uh, organizational principles uh, kicking in that just weren't there in the single cell state. Um, you can, uh, cells uh, have these clocks inside them, these oscillations. And uh, in the single cell world, an oscillation just periodically changes the state of a cell. But in the multicellular state, the oscillation can lead to spatial segmentation. So you have, um, you're mobilizing things that existed before, that evolved in the single cell world, but then when they meet up with the physics of um, called mesoscale, middle scale materials, you get all these morphogenetic processes, these form producing processes that come into play. So to give an example, um, a molecule of water um, doesn't have waves and it doesn't have whirlpools. It's just a molecule and it has the physics of molecules. When you have a lot of molecules of water, they make liquid water and then you can get, um, you can get all sorts of disturbances and, uh, and wave-like and, and vortex-like phenomena which you would never see in the individual molecule. It's not that the molecules have changed, but the scale has changed. So new physics comes in and um, organizes the system. So the selection that you're referring to, though, is not Darwinian Well, yes. So let me, survival of the fittest. So let me go on from there, yes. So, um, uh, so as I said, um, the forms that you get uh, are not due to Darwinian selection. They're due to the inherent properties of the system. But many of those forms may not be viable, uh, that you might get forms due to physical organization that um, are just are not suited to this world. They, uh, they just can't find a place to live. They can't eat or whatever. Uh, so there'll, there'll be a shakeout phenomena. Some of them will survive and others won't. So in that sense, the Darwinian mechanism of selection is, is a kind of culling process. It, it doesn't create the forms, but it, um, it basically determines um, which, one of, which ones of them will persist in, in, in the world. So there is a role to this um, Darwinian selection, but it's not a role of building up forms in an incremental fashion, or at least by and large it isn't. It's, it's culling uh, these uh, self-organized forms um, and, and uh, just selecting among them. Um, as these terms apply to your hypothesis, what do you mean by um, sort of self-organization you've described? But um, um, you had brought in self-assembly and the distinction. Um, many scientists say the terms self-organization and self-assembly are interchangeable. Uh, some say the snowflake forms by self-organization. You call the snowflake formation process self-assembly. Some scientists describe the self-assembly of the hydra, for instance. Uh, you 
did extensive experiments with the Hydra in the early 1970s in England uh, at the University of Sussex. And, and you term the Hydra's regenerating process.